Hey everyone, today let's build this transmission. This is going to be the transmission that is going to go into EV for drag racing. It's going to have some extra short ratios. It's a narrow E series with a wide differential. And we've also converted it to forward shift in order to make it MR2 compatible. Let's roll the disassembly footage while I tell you why I did this. So a while ago, I built what ended up being the 405 wheel horsepower 2GR. Um, that engine ended up actually even exceeding my expectations. I was hoping to get to high 370s, 380s, and instead it hit 405. That car was never meant to be put together in a way that was actually going to run on the street, or never mind the drag strip. So the transmission it had in there was out of a diesel Avensis. It's just, it's a transmission I already had in the shop that was kicking around. It was forward shift already, so it just made everything easy. So I went ahead and used it. Unfortunately, when I did take it to the drag strip, um, and there's a link in the top corner there if you need to see it, um, it did a really, really terrible 60 foot time. In fact, let's go ahead and put the stats from the best run in here. As you can see, that 60 foot time, which is the biggest issue on this thing, is just atrocious. When I first put the 2GR together back in 2008, uh, back then we were making 275 wheel horsepower. Uh, the red line wasn't even elevated, so it was redlining at 6,500 RPM. And even that car did a 13 flat with a 1.760 foot time. As you can see, this thing here uh, did a 60 foot that was significantly worse despite having way more power. And that's just because the gearing was absolutely awful. Um, so this transmission here is going to fix that. What you're seeing now is the ratios for the transmission that I built. And importantly, the next revision of the engine is going to be spinning 9,000 RPM, not 8,000 RPM. So with this gearing, we can still hit a little over 40 in first gear. We can hit about 75 in second. And we'll actually have the 3-4 shift at a decent time. And we're going to get to the end of the quarter mile before needing fifth. So fifth is really just a cruising gear if I ever take this thing on a kind of drag and drive event. Also, since the main intent for this thing is drag racing, we're going to put a spool in here. There's no reason to have a differential just getting in the way. And that quick, we have everything apart. So in theory here, all we need to do is fully disassemble this one, fully disassemble this one, because we are using this shaft with all of these gears. But on top of that, in order to properly inspect everything in here, I want to take this apart, though it will get reassembled exactly as it is right now. So let's get to the press. And this, this is the kind of puzzle that I enjoy. <laughs> um, right here is the RAV4, the output shaft, as well as the shaft itself, but everything that's on it. This, um, I did figure it out, I counted the gears and whatnot. This is an E56 output shaft. And there's the input shaft, the input shaft itself, so that I can inspect the gears. Um, though all this stuff here, we're not going to use. Essentially, we're gonna take this output shaft here from the RAV4, we're gonna put it in there and reassemble this stuff on it and that'll change our final drive because this is what drives the uh, the bull gear on the differential. But something else I noticed, I was originally planning on doing this with an E350, but I had that E56 just sitting around and it wasn't even a complete transmission, so I figured I'd make the best of it. But um, the synchro assembly on the E350, I've got it here uh, for first and second, is actually better. So I'm going to use this. It's it's honestly a little hard to describe how it's better, but the, the big takeaway here is in this ring here, you can see this part here was made with the intention of triple synchronizers. When they made this one, they machined this part out. And if you look at older ones, it won't have these pockets in here. This was more of an afterthought and that gives the synchro, um, the brass part of the synchro, oh, here, ends up 
this inner one here has these three lugs on here. It doesn't take as long before it engages. It's got just that little bit. On here, I don't know why they made the slot so big because it makes it so that this element doesn't engage. Um, uh, frankly, I'm willing to believe that it doesn't engage at all because if you look in here, there's literally no marks from that synchro and brass will generally transfer a little bit to steel. So I think this synchro here was actually not being that part of the triple sinker was just not being used so what was happening is this part here was transferring to the gear to the gear here we go and this was effectively acting as if it was part of the gear just just like any other gear uh single synchro gear except it just had a little bit of slop in it but all the force was being transferred through this uh, gotta make sure I don't mix up the parts here. Now something else I wanted to show you guys. So yeah, so I'm going to use the first and second out of an E350. Um, and I'm going to put it with the rest of the stuff from the E56. Uh, the ratios are exactly the same. So there's no, there's no problem there. But I wanted to show you guys, people say the E153 is the only strong transmission. And I wanted to show you guys why people say that. And here is... Here's a first gear from an E-153. This guy, this guy's got some gravity to her. Um, and if we look at, this is from the, the wide E, and if we look at from the narrow, you can see there's definitely, there's definitely a thickness difference there that you can tell. Um, but the other thing you have to keep in mind that a lot of people ignore is first of all, it doesn't matter how big something is, once you're past how big it needs to be, um, you're just adding rotational mass and that's just going to slow down your shifts. But the other thing that people forget, this right here is an E153 output shaft. So the wide E-series. This is the output shaft from a narrow E-series. The This one here is supported between this bearing and this bearing right here, whereas this one is quite a bit further, a little over an inch further. That means when you're putting torque through here, this thing for the same amount of power going through it is going to bend more. And all the diameters are the same, except for this one here, which of course will make this one regain some of its strength. How much exactly? I, I don't have the right math to do that math. Um, and also on the narrow E-series, the bearing for first gear is a much larger diameter, which prevents the, um, which makes it, you know, you gotta keep in mind, everything is a spring when you push on it hard enough. Um, it'll make it so that this gear can rock back and forth less. And the cleaner you can keep that engagement, the more likely, well, the less likely you are to break things. So I think this is, these are part of the reasons why these narrow E-series are, really able to put up to a lot more power than people give them credit for, despite the fact that the transmission is about 25 pounds lighter. It, it's, and there could also be, there could be some things in the metal. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a way to inspect the metal, but they do, most of these do actually look the same. The other huge advantage with the narrow E-series is right here. So this is, this is a third gear. I think it's the third gear. Uh, either way, it'll represent the right thing. From an E-153. And if you look, do you see how these teeth here, they're kind of a, they're an even pyramid on both sides? That is part of what catches uh, when you're shifting into gear. Well, if we compare with the third gear here, and you look, do you see how that, that's asymmetric right there? That gives it, because the the way that this is turning, that gives it a bigger landing area, a bigger area to put that force against so it's not breaking this thing as much once you go into gear. Because this is the part that gets damaged when your shifting goes to hell. Um, it's because these teeth here are chipped. And in fact, let me see if I can find one with some damage. Yeah, here we go. This one's out of an EB60. Um, but you can take a look. See, see how these are all rounded? What this causes when that ring goes on here it just makes it bounce off 
uh, because the angle gets shallower so it can push back harder for the same amount of torque with it. It's, I'm sorry, I know I'm going into technical details here. Um, but essentially that bigger area makes it easier to shift and makes the parts last longer. And this is critical because on the E153, when you try to shift into second, if you're at 8,000 RPM, um, it often doesn't want to. It just locks you out of the shift until your RPMs on the engine have dropped a little bit and then it'll let you go in. So you either end up grinding your gears because you're pushing too hard or you just have to wait, wait, and wait. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. You only have to wait a little bit, but then it lets you go into the gear once the RPMs are much more close to matched. And, and that's just, that's just not great for drag racing, right? So that's why we're using a narrow E-series beyond just the weight savings. The next thing I need to do, I need to clean all these up. Well, all the ones that I'm going to use up, um, get all the other stuff off the table here and yeah. Putting the input shaft together is a pretty easy task. Um, you just have to be careful when you're pressing things together because gravity is going to want to pull it apart. So you're going to want to make sure you press it in the correct orientation so gravity is holding everything together. Um, this shaft, that, well this whole transmission has to be one of the easiest transmissions to service. I, I really enjoy working on it. There's just a couple snapping grooves. Um, there's those Torx bolts for the mid plate that are a little bit annoying, but otherwise it's it's quite simple. Um, here you can see I'm struggling. It's it's not obvious in the video what I'm struggling with, but I'm struggling because it doesn't want to shift into, uh, I think that's fourth. Um, I never figured out why, but I disassembled it and put it back together and it shifted perfectly. So something must have been just slightly out of place, but either way, um, you just want to check these things, move everything through the motions when you're putting it back together, and that'll ensure that at the end you've got a working transmission. Um, of course, I'm putting this together by memory. I've worked on these E-Series so much that I don't need the manual, but the factory service manual is really, really helpful. It walks you through all the steps you need, all the things you need to check, um, and uh, if, if you're doing this, you should follow that. There's going to be a link in the description for the Toyota Service Manuals. Um, it's a website they make available. It's pretty cheap to get a two-day subscription, and that gives you access to literally all of Toyota's documentation. So, so it's a pretty invaluable resource. And now that our shaft is together, the next thing to do is, you see how these are taper roller bearings? We need to set the preload on our output shaft. In order to do that, we need to put the case together, and the case... <laughs> It's nasty. I'm not touching that anymore than I have to. So I'm going to go clean it. I'll save you guys the footage on that. What I can't put footage of is the mid-case machining, and I'll explain why in a second. So now that we've got a much cleaner transmission, I can show you why we did what we did. Um, on these original transmissions, the shift lever went in like this, and to shift, this rotates and goes in and out. Now, on the MR2, because it's mounted in the rear of the car, this is the shift lever. And it goes through here. Come on. It goes through here, and also goes in and out and rotates. It's the same movement, except it's on the uh, front of the transmission. That way the shift cables can reach it and whatnot. Now, I used, <laughs> I used my CNC machine to do this because I've got one. Um, Alex put together a nice guide and also this shaft here is a little hard to get because um, this is an MR2 specific part. Alex has a replica of this. There's going to be links in the description uh, to get there. And yeah, you can do it by hand. He's got instructions. So now that we've got that, um, it's time to put this thing together enough to set our preload. So that shouldn't be too hard. Um, important note, since I had to pry the case apart, um, you need to make sure I used a stone to flatten out any of the... Uh, the spots that got raised. Um, otherwise the transmission case will sit funny and just 
it'll leak or cause accelerated wear. No fun. For this step, we need just the output shaft. Um, oh, well, the output shaft. We also need some oil um, because we're going to be testing how much torque it takes to turn this guy. So we want it to be realistic. Now, technically, Toyota says you have to fully torque the case on here. Um, if you're trying to follow the instructions, you also should. I have not found it to make much of a difference. I put three on each side, and that's generally good, and I get them nice and tight by hand. We're going to put two more bolts on the other side also, but first we need to get the bearing race in here so that it doesn't flop around. And here we just want to kind of run in the bearings a little bit, get them to seat. These bolts on the other side are a bit annoying, but they are the closest one to that bearing, so it makes sense to use those. That feels good. Let's get the torque wrench. All right. We've got seven inch pounds, which is right in the range of 4.3 to 8.7 for a used bearing and no i have not replaced the bearings in here so next thing we gotta do we've got our spool actually i'm not sure if i told you guys already we're gonna be running a spool so i gotta get the ring gear on here and we gotta put it in here and we gotta measure the preload with that Sometimes they're not so tight, and you can just get them off with a chunk of brass. All right, sorry about that. Forgot to hit record. Um, I just zipped in four bolts so we can uh, measure the preload on the bearings. Um, obviously, we're going to need to come back and actually torque this all properly, but we'll do that in a bit. Oh, that might... I don't know. Let's run it in. Um, it does spin, but it might be a little on the tight side. All right, let's see if that helped. Okay. So that's about 23. Um, minus the 7 we had up here is 16. And this should be adding 1 to 2. Uh, plus, the gear ratio is different than what the factory service manual indicates, which should reduce that even further. So... Um, our shim is too thick. We need to reduce the shim. Okay, 2.34 millimeters. So, let's see. All right, and the factory service manual says we need to go 0.8 millimeters thinner. So that's quite a bit thinner. Um, I'm going to go search see if i can find something before we have to grind this down all right so i went and i looked at the factory service manual and the thinnest that shim gets is two millimeters so i definitely won't have one sitting around now right off camera over there i do have a surface grinder and there's plenty of thickness here to do it in um, but i want to do a sanity check first uh, we're going to take this we're going to take some clay and just kind of put it there and then we're going to put the bearing in place we're going to assemble the transmission we're going to squish it together and then we're going to see you know, essentially what our zero clearance point is right how thick this clay gets squished down and uh, hopefully that'll help us i actually owe this trick to team rip engineering up in michigan when I was up there seeing what they were doing to Ben's transmission, this is something they showed me, and frankly, it's a really pretty awesome trick, because the factory service manual, when it specifies, you know, one shim up, one shim down, gives you so much. That estimate is only so good until, you know, you're more than several shims away. Um, the precision on that just loses all of its meaning. So this gives you a nice baseline. Uh, if you're ordering shims, you can order a couple shims around this size. Okay, so just confirming that nothing has gone bad. That was about six or seven. So that's telling us that the diff is presenting 
no preload at this point. So let's pull it apart and see what that thickness is. Yeah, all right. Well, it's not out of spec. It's 2.05 millimeters. That would be zero preload. And according to factory service manual, we want about 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 millimeters thicker than that. Um, that's still way outside of where the factory one usually lands. So in all the transmissions I've taken apart, I don't have one thin enough for that. So when we don't have something that we need, we make it. We're at uh, two point, no, oh, here you go. We are 2.15 millimeters thick. Um, that should get us in the right range. All right. So we're at 11 inch pounds. So we need to take about another 0 0.05 millimeters off of that shim. It's annoying, but doing it right matters. In the end, I reground that shim two more times and I ended right at 2.05 millimeters. I'm tired, I'm shaking. I can see when I'm moving that it is lower, but because I'm shaking, the needle's going back and forth and it's reading high, so it's time to get some sleep. Um, I'm happy with this though. It's, it's about eight which is right where it should be. It, it should be. It's on the lower end of where it should be, but keep in mind we have the gear ratio change. So let me get some sleep, but in a few seconds, you guys will see me actually start assembling this thing. At this point, everything is all shimmed in. Um, I did not do it on camera. I did check the synchros, make sure they had sufficient clearance. Uh, it's not like new parts are easily available. So everything in there is reused, but everything is with an appropriate spec. Um, don't worry, we're not doing any machining right now. This is just the most stable vise I have in the shop. So we need to torque the ring gear on and then we're gonna go back to the transmission and start assembling everything. We've got most of what we need here, nice and clean. We've got our shafts. So step one is oil pump and that kind of stuff. So let's get these out of the way. This first plate catches oil that's slung off the ring gear and feeds the uh, output bearing. And then we get the oil pump in there. Now comes the fun step. We need to put basically everything in at the same time. So all we need is five hands and we should be good to go. Now this is the trick that I use. Um, I'll balance the differential in here, kind of like that. So it's kind of cocked because notice how this bearing here is larger than the pinion gear here. So it actually has to slip under. So by balancing it like that, we can just hold this assembly, worry about getting the three shafts aligned with these three holes and the input and the output shaft aligned all at the same time. And then you just kind of knock the differential and it should fall in place. Like that. All right. <laughs> you know how stuff doesn't usually work out on camera? That was the first shot. Um, it's usually a lot more of a struggle than that. <laughs> but hey. It worked. Now we need reverse. There we go. Just want to make sure this all fits.
And there you go. There's all of the internals, at least the internals for the mid case. So clean up that uh, outer gasket seal one more time. Make sure there's no oil on there. And then we're going to use our TV and seal it up. Oh, I almost forgot, actually. Without this, we would not have had any oil pumping. You want to make sure this reverse bolt lines up early, because otherwise you've got to take the whole thing apart again. Now it's time for the fifth gear assembly. Um, one thing we can't forget is the snap ring now that the input shaft's in place. Plus we need to add Loctite to these, so it's gotta come out anyways. And to torque this nut, what we're gonna do is we're gonna lock it into two gears at the same time. But in order to do that, First, we need to actually have a synchro here to lock into because we can put it in one gear like this, but now we need a second gear. There's interlocks in here, so I can't put, I can't put the other ones in there. Everything moves freely. We can still see our two pins. So we got it correct. And now we are in two gears at once. So we can torque this guy. Uh, well, that's the beauty of taking two transmissions apart. <laughs> We've got an extra. Pretty sure I heard where that one went, but uh, I'm not going to bother looking for it. There. The rest from here is pretty simple. We just need to seal the cover, put the uh, shift mechanism in, and... Uh, we're done. And there it is. As soon as I've got the 9,000 RPM motor to put in front of this thing, this thing will go back in EV and hit the drag strip, hopefully with a better 60 foot time, which will result in a better quarter mile time and there's going to be some better acceleration along the way also just from the gearing in this. Before I say bye to you guys, since you guys have stayed to the end, you're the people I care about the most. I've got this transmission. Um, I've also got a 2022 F350 that has an automatic transmission. And the transmission, no, no. The transmission's programming is absolute hot trash. This is to save my sanity. I'm converting it over to manual. Is this something you guys are interested in seeing? Generally, when a channel posts something that isn't their main bread and butter, like, you know, these things, um, views go to hell. So I want to know from you guys. I'm doing this project one way or another. Do you guys want to see it? All right, that's all I got. Have a good one.